Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, lawmakers prepare support for the heightened flood risk this spring, propose to simplify school rating systems and help fund scholarships for low and middle income kids, and offer greater resources for Minnesota firefighters. Stay tuned for this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. As winter turns into spring, the risk of flooding due to the massive snowpack is concerning. At a recent press conference, House members joined Senator Mark Johnson in urging immediate action to refill the empty coffers in the Disaster Assistance Contingency Account. Last year, in a year that did not see record snowfall, with just two floods in Brainerd and Duluth, $11 million was allocated draining the account that sits nearly empty today. We get a little bit of flooding every year, but what we've had in snowfall this year, uh, the, pro the projections are, are scary, quite frankly, uh, for the amount of water that's coming our way. Uh, it's interesting to note that the weather conditions for this year are really uh, quite lined well with 1965. And that's a year that featured a lot of record-setting flooding up and down the Minnesota River Valley. We had uh, a lot of moisture in the fall, so the soil is saturated. We had a good solid freeze because we didn't have a lot of snow, so the, the frost went very deep. Now we have a very moisture-laden, heavy snowpack. This account does not pay for a disaster. This account sets up a series of protocols for payments so we can get direct aid to people and then launch 13 state agencies, all the local units of government, and everybody can get aid to these people or these units of government as quickly as possible. So I applaud your efforts because last Wednesday, we went through the same thing in the Greater Minnesota Committee. And I would hope, because this fund was underfunded the last four years, and I'm not going to say who is in charge, but we're hoping this year that we will put in place a fund that will avoid special sessions and we can get aid to these people as quickly as possible. It's a great point because we can't control what's going to happen in June, July, or August, whether they're straight line winds, tornadoes, or floods, or any other disaster. So we need to make sure that this is properly funded now. Senator Johnson now joins me to talk more about it. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. This is really an honor to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, last weekend, rivers were overflowing their banks to the south in Iowa, Nebraska. We've had record snowfall totals around the state this winter. Your district endured the destructive 1997 Red River flood. The National Weather Service has forecast a 90% chance of river flooding um, in many areas of the state. There's a growing concern. Yeah, yeah, there sure is. I remember back in 97, I was just in middle school, high school at the time, uh, and we went over, well, my community was just about 45 minutes an hour uh, to the east of uh, East Grand Forks, and we went over two or three times to go help Sandbag. And I was there the night that the uh, dikes broke loose in East Grand Forks. We were told, get on the bus, get on the bus. And as we were driving out of town, I remember watching the water go up on those steps as we were driving out. And by the time we got to Crookston, all the dikes had broken and levees were let loose and, and flooded. But, so I remember that, that, you know, what was going on, just that disaster that was happening around you. And so now when you see the snowfall this year, everybody that's been through that process feels that anxiousness of what's going to happen how are we going to get through this this year now we've spent a lot of money both on the federal side and the state side on preparing these communities for possibility of, of high waters but what do we do for you know there's all sorts of city infer of county infrastructure of you know roads and bridges of ditches systems that will get washed away in this so how do we prepare the state if something like that happens again. And I think, you know, the bill that we've got up uh, to replenish the disaster account would be uh, one of those ways of getting the state prepared for, you know, something like that to happen again. The uh, disaster fund was created in 2014 so that relief can be more immediately offered following mm -hmm. a natural disaster. Currently, the account sit, sits empty. So what happened to the money that had been there? Sure, and we saw this in the last couple of years where uh, because this account was set up so that when we're not in session, we're able to re react quickly as a state and fund those projects instead of getting back together and finding that money. Um, but, you know, things like the out east when Duluth was flooded, you know, and there was even things down south, um, I forget the county down there, but there was a couple of different areas where we ended up spending quite a few dollars out of that account 
and really deplenish. I think right now it's virtually zero, but I think it's six hundred thousand dollars that are un unencumbered. Um, which you know, you know, a crossing could be six hundred thousand right, dollars. So. Right, that would go very quickly. Yeah. The governor's budget proposal calls for ten million dollars to be added to this fund, but your bill asks for twenty million dollars mm -hmm. this year and twenty million dollars next year for a total of forty million dollars. Yep. Uh, why are you asking for more than the governor? I think it, it's prudent for us to have a fund big enough to handle. Uh, any of these weather events that happen, whether it's flooding from a river or washouts, we can have a big event that would easily take up you know, most of that, that money uh, out of the account. And, and for us to have that sitting aside, ready for any community asking for it, I think it's just prudent and, and the right thing to do. Um, $10 million, we've seen that go in, in one weather event, you know, when things happened out in Duluth. Um, that was that took up almost the entire fund. So let's make sure we have enough in there so that we can go and help our, our communities that need it. Uh, according to the Pioneer Press, DFL Representative Gene Pulowski, who's a cre who is credited with uh, creating this fund, said that funding at, at, to at least right now is not urgent because, and you sort of re referenced this already, mm -hmm. the legislature is in session. So right, right. until if any flooding that would occur between now and you know May twentieth. To, both bodies could get together yep. and say, let's, let's put some money. So talk a little bit about the urgency factor. Well, it, it, so there's a couple of things going on here. First of all, we've got a depleted fund. So we've got to make sure that we can, we can put some money into that. And this is being proactive, trying to get that money into that fund. But then it's also just the long term, let's make sure that money is in there. Um, whether we're in session or we're not in session, that fund is going to be used. So let's make sure it has the adequate cushion on it. Instead of all of a sudden there gets to be an event and we get emotional and we have these reactions, let's have the money in there so we're not just reacting to different things that are going on throughout the state. Um, now this, to me, it just makes sense. We keep depleting this fund. Why not have that uh, available so that we can use that when it's needed? So with that in mind, uh, considering the frequency of these uh, mm -hmm. weather-related destructive disasters of recent years, is it time for just a regular line item in the budget to just, you know, every two years, a specific amount of money gets mm -hmm. put here just for this circumstance? And I like that idea. I think, you know, it's, it's one of the core services that government, whether it's local government or state government, that we need to make sure that our citizens are safe and that the infrastructure that we have around them is protected. Now, I think it's a good idea to have some consistent funding in that because we're going to be using it, you know, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but eventually we're going to be using this money out of there. And it's probably a good idea to have that constant stream in there to replenish funds as they, you know, like we see right now, we're down to nearly zero in the account. I think a good idea would be not to put this into a political fight, but to keep this an ongoing uh, spending item. Uh, I think that's a good idea. One more thing. Uh, last week, the Senate approved a bill that would expand the Disaster Recovery Loan Program, which is offered through the yep. Rural Finance Authority, to help farmers recover from their losses from this heavy snowpack, uh, barns collapsing, and, and farmers having to completely sell off their herds even. Mm -hmm. Uh, does it make sense for the state to have multiple means of financing recovery efforts based on the type of event that occurs? Right. I, I think it does. I think it really does. If you've got a, a farming operation and a, a barn goes down or, or you, you, know, you lose some herd in there, you'd want people that, that have some expertise, have some experience with that administering those funds and checking up on that. Now, I don't think it would be a good idea to have the disaster account that's more geared towards counties and, and townships be administering funds that are going to farms. I think we need some expertise in that. The ability to come along these organizations and, and government entities, being able to help them through that process. Now, I, I think that's good to have that expertise. So, yeah, there, there gets to be, you know, these silos, but at the same time, and that comes with some benefit, and, and I don't see a problem personally with, with having it split up uh, to be able to help those that really need it. Senator Johnson, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really do enjoy this. At a recent Welcome Senate E-12 Senate Education Committee hearing, testifiers spoke both for and against a bill that would require the Department of Education to create an easily understood academic rating system for public schools. How can we expect families, and particularly families who have been historically marginalized, 
to engage in helping schools improve if we don't provide clear, concise information about how the schools are doing right now. I've heard loud and clearly from many families that they are in support of this bill for the main reason of having something that's simple, easy to understand, and gives them a starting point on making the best decision for their kids. The dashboard is confusing. If, you're, if the school is in the bottom 5%, most parents don't know. And I think a 1 through 5, 8 through F, or a 0 to 100 rating system will give parents an easier way of understanding the data. Currently, it's just too hard to find, to understand, or to act on the information that's presented in the current school report cards. The summative rating which is proposed in this bill will make it easier for people to understand how well a school is serving all children and their own children. Broadly, stakeholders did not express an interest in a star rating system, um, or any summative rating system for that matter. Um, most stakeholders reported they felt that that was um, a punitive system and, shame, and shaming in nature. A single indicator, such as test scores, viewed out of context can be misleading as a measure of performance. I'm concerned that the academic <coughs> achievement rating system proposed in Senate File 299 does not align with the priorities shared with me by my school community. <coughs> what I hear is that parents want to know that their children's education is comprehensive, that it is safe, and that it's engaging for their students. A rating system based largely on grades three through eight MCA test scores for proficiency and achievement gaps provides a smaller slice of student experiences and it is a slice on which the regional centers often perform worse than their neighbors. There's already an open enrollment outflow of students from regional center schools to their neighbors and it's well documented by the Center for Rural Policy and Development. I fear that a single point rating system based on elementary test scores will accelerate this already troubling trend. Senator Roger Chamberlain now joins me to talk about bills to create a simpler school rating system and to establish tax credits for donations to K-12 scholarship programs. Thanks for being here. Good afternoon. Let's begin with the creation of what's referred to as a summative school rating system, like five stars or A through F that would be applied to <clears throat> schools. Uh, why is this necessary? Simplicity and transparency. A lot of parents out, if you go to the MDE website or a school website. And I have they are almost impossible to understand or read. Most, uh, most uh, college graduates can't understand this. It takes too long to get the information and get it uh, into a form usable and comparable. So this is a simple way to allow parents access to clear, transparent information uh, uh, to the performance of the schools and then allow them to compare it to others. So a quick snapshot. This isn't the first rodeo for this bill. I, know, I remember it came up last uh, session and you've made some changes since then. What have you changed and why? The, the bill last year was very prescriptive. We had, it was a bit longer, very prescriptive, how the school should do it. This year, uh, they stripped all of that out and just said, basically, they turned over the responsibility to cr of creating a rating system to the Department of Education. They can bring in people and consult but the responsibility will be turned over to them to create the system. And they can be very flexible. It's based on state law, world's best workforce, and rankings uh, of uh, ESSA at the federal level. They can use a combination of those. They're already available. They collect the data. So all they got to do is put it in a usable, usable format for parents to understand. And parents want it. So you mentioned ratings. And and I'm just wondering, is the idea then similar to U.S. News and World Report has their best high school rankings? Uh, is it something like that, but then for all schools, so just you can quickly compare and contrast different yes. schools? Yes, absolutely. The, the schools should have nothing to hide. And our job is to make sure that the parents have uh, in understandable information. They should have nothing to hide. And if they do, then they should improve it. The parents should have the opportunity to look at these schools and then compare them. And there is nothing in there that they couldn't adjust and tweak and account for, whether it's uh, uh, English as a second language students or anything else. So it's all about transparency and the parents want it. The surveys, the data shows that they, they want it, they'd use it, it'd be good for them. Is this just for public schools or does it also apply to private schools and charter schools? Well, we only have jurisdiction over the public schools. so. Public schools would include the uh, charter schools as well. Okay. 
Uh, if the bill passes and as a result a family learns that their children are attending a school with a poor score, what can or should they do with this information? Well, I, uh, I don't know. We haven't thought about that, but certainly it's information a parent can use. The schools aren't going to be happy if there are three stars or four stars, but um, it's not an easy job for MDE to do, but we were going to do it from last year. They decided they didn't like that, so we'll come at it from a different approach. But uh, we don't know. I'm sure the parents will look at it and, you know. Would consumers they're... hold us accountable for everything, right? They, whether you're buying shoes or a jacket or a car, uh, consumers hold uh, the, 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 the vendors accountable, and that's how they should be. We serve the citizens. And some of the testimony is just unbelievable how they want to fight back and push back against the desire and the will and the wishes of the citizens. It's unbelievable. Uh, rating systems do exist in other states, yes. and critics across the nation have pointed out that this single letter grade or a single, you know, a number of stars or whatever is an incomplete picture of the school and that it's just too simple of a measure. So how do you respond to that? I say then you start with that this, the rating system is not the end game. They can put anything else up there on the dashboard they want. But here's the rating system, and here's the five bullet points, and here's something else you should see, something else you should know. Here's what we have for school, for music, et cetera. Those are important things. The parents are going to take those into consideration. You have to trust the parents. A lot of these people just don't trust parents. they got to trust parents. They're the customers, and they ought to trust them. They know better. Let's turn now to tax credits. Uh, you've Whoa, proposed good. the Equity and Opportunity Scholarship Act, yes. which would provide tax credits to individuals or corporations for scholarships directed to low and middle income kids. What is the objective of this? Opportunity for kids. Uh, we have some, uh, to sum it up, new solutions, new opportunities, new hope for uh, kids to solve some old uh, stubborn K-12 problems. We. Anybody, who, uh, anybody you talk to, it's talked about every day in, this build, in these buildings, about the problems and the challenges with K-12. Well, let's have something different. Let's try a different approach, a different route to give these parents some, uh, empower parents, give them the choice and options. Too many kids are stuck in, there's a lot of great schools and a lot of great educators. There's a lot of bad schools and a lot of bad educators. A lot of kids are stuck in bad schools and they can't get out. When other people who have the means can get out, this is a this levels a playing field. It gives those low and uh, middle income kids who could not otherwise get out and find new opportunities. It gives them new opportunity, new hope to get the education they need and they want. Parents can choose. We choose everything else. We choose, as I said in the in the press conference and in the um, testimony. Right now, the state of Minnesota gives state money, so you can choose the preschool you want. We give state money at the higher ed level to choose the college university you want to go to, grant money, private or public. Same on the preschool, private or public. We bookend it, in the middle, they get left out. So it's, this is not new, this is just empowers parents and puts the uh, power of choice in their hands and not in my hands or bureaucrats' hands. So people, corporations, donate money to a 501c3 and then this entity then provides scholarship money so these kids then can go to any school that they choose. Yes, exactly, including public schools. We have, we have three found. We have three things you can do. It can be a two two foundations: a, a regular qualified foundation and a qualified public school foundation. So anyone can create a 501c3 that would be a qualified foundation or qualified public school foundation, and they can contribute to it, and they can give money to public schools or private schools. Well, you don't give it to them directly. You create the foundation, and it funnels through different ways through the kids. Um, so the public schools are not left out. As I said and has been said before, this is liberating not only to kids and parents, families, but also educators, and this will improve outcomes. It will improve outcomes. We have to do something different. The web of uh, bureaucracy and, and the uh, gauntlet you've got to run to change the simplest thing isn't working for these kids. They need the same opportunities, deserve the same opportunities that every other kid that other kids have in this state. They deserve those opportunities. We even have a transportation uh, 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 process there too where 
you can take money from the qualified foundation and give it to a kid so they can be transported across district lines to go to another public school. So the public schools are not left out of this. They're part of the equation. They're part of the whole system, and we need them. And we need strong public education and pub public schools. But we have to change how we do it. Senator Chamberlain, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good to see you again. The work of firefighters puts them at greater risk of certain health conditions. At a recent press conference, lawmakers, along with Minnesota firefighters, advocated for the creation of the Hometown Heroes Assistance Program. You will hear the stories today about the high incidence among our firefighters of cancer, cardiac issues, and mental health challenges they face just to be able to do the jobs we ask them to do. Compared to other states in the nation, Minnesota ranks 21st in population. Unfortunately, we rank 45th in our support of the Minnesota Fire Service, so we're fifth from the bottom. And this bill will go a little ways towards changing that funding paradigm. We're doing the best we can to change the outcome of the three leading killers of firefighters, but we need help. So I'm asking um, that since in Minnesota, if you call, a team of firefighters will come and deliver. So what we need is elected officials to deliver for those firefighters. We need help. There's a downside to this rewarding career, and that is uh, mental health issues that a lot of us face, the addiction issues that a lot of us face, uh, the, the cancer and cardiac risks that a lot of us are facing. Joining me now is the Senate author of the bill to establish the Hometown Heroes Assistance Program, Senator Steve Svitzinski. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. What inspired you to bring this bill forward? Um, two things. One, um, when I was a young man, uh, I had this pretty horrible car accident, and I think people like the firefighters of Minnesota saved my life. And I, I, not that I've been thinking about this for 40 years, how can I pay them back, but um, I think for me, this is how I'd like to be able to pay them back for the people that saved my life. And, um, and it's classic how a bill becomes a law 101. A constituent came to me, happened to be a firefighter, and he met with me, and we talked, and it started the ball rolling, and now here we are today um, introdu or having introduced the bill in the House and the Senate, and it's exactly to all the listeners, um, when you come see your representatives and your senators, it's exactly um, how it's supposed to work. You present your ideas, and next thing you know, um, it's, it's, it's an idea before the people and the Senate and the House. Though sometimes it takes more than one year to get through, sometimes it's a long process. This has been more than a year, yeah. Okay, so it, this, is, this started a few years ago? I, th I believe three now, okay. or two for sure, two and a half, we'll go two and a half. Okay, and you're still working on it. Well, at the press conference that you had to talk about this bill, George Esbenson, the president of the Minnesota Firefighter Initiative, said that Minnesota is 45th out of 50 states in investing in the fire service. So what does he mean? We pride ourselves in Minnesota as being a state that takes care of its people. And we think we're top 10 in everything, but this is one area that we, we, we're horrible in. And it's funding for firefighters on how we take care of them with their health needs. And firefighters have higher than, and I think we're going to talk about this, but their incident of, of, um, of cardiac arrest and trauma, PTSD, um, and um, cancer is, is horrible. And, um, and if we allot for the $7.2 million, um, as George pointed out at the press conference, we will go from 45th to 44th in the nation. And so even though it sounds like a lot of money, we're, still, we're only moving this much. And how much money overall is the bill asking for? $7.2 in seven. the biennium. Okay. Uh, you mentioned it. The three leading killers of firefighters are cardiac conditions, cancer, and emotional, mental trauma. Let's start with cancer and heart disease. What would this bill for an individual, individual who gets one of those diagnoses? Yeah, it'll allow, I think, five or four um, meetings a year with, with experts in, in, in cardiac and cancer awareness programs, counseling type sessions to help them through that process. I think also, as um, people of my era know, um, at one time cancer wasn't talked about. And so, you know, Ant has, 
she's sick. Don't bother mm -hmm. her right now. And, and now who would think twice about saying, well, your aunt has cancer. And, and I think right now with firefighters, and one of the things I compared them with, you know, is um, um, Dwayne Johnson and um, um, John Wayne and Wonder Woman as uh, these heroes that just show up and we don't ask them, are you really a human being that's here to save me today? And, and I think this bill will remove the stigma that they are somehow gods um, that are impervious to pain and suffering and, and they're real human beings and like our veterans, they need to be taken care of. Yeah, I was just, I was just gonna say like soldiers, um, there's been a lot of coverage now on PTSD and, and trying to get them to come forward and recognize that they need help and that they're not invincible and, and the things that happen in a fire or a first responder situation can have long-term effects. Uh, there was a, a study done by the International Association of Firefighters, actually a survey of more than 7,000 respondents in the United States. More than 76% had critical job-related stress, uh, thoughts of suicide and difficulty in relationships and substance abuse. How would this bill help those types of mental traumas that are specific to firefighters and first responders? Well, I think these men and women that feel like they can't go see a counselor because of their heroic status, the, the stigma, or not the stigma, but how they feel, uh, I think it'll make them more comfortable because the funding will allow for them, like I said, the four visits a year um, to see a counselor. I, and I, I think that would be a good thing. I think the, um, serving on the Vets Committee, we, we do so many wonderful things for the veterans, as we should. And I think firefighters and first responders and police officers um, are the next group we need to be looking at because they suffer, they're suffering from things that we just can never relate with, the things they see and have to deal with. Uh, another thing that was mentioned in the press conference is that there's going to be these regional centers of excellence, so there will be places no matter where you live in the state. If you're a part-time firefighter or a full-time firefighter or a volunteer firefighter, you will have access to the kinds of care that you need. Is that right? Yeah, and I think um, one of the, uh, the people that spoke today said an hour and a half that's as far as they should have to drive, and I'm kind of like, that seemed pretty far that you would still have to drive an hour and a half. But yeah, they, they, I don't, there must be firefighters that have to drive three and four hours to seek the special help they might need, and that's ridiculous. One more thing, uh, the bill has bipartisan support. Yes. Senator Jim Abler and Paul Anderson have signed on. Uh, as Republicans and, and Nick Frentz and Matt Little are our, our DFL co-sponsors, uh, what do you think the future of the bill is? You said it's already been two and a half years now. Is this the year or is it just more work? Keep chugging along. I'm positive this year. I, I know that the, um, the Senate chair is over, um, not overwhelmed, but is very, very busy with a lot of issues and a lot of bills on his desk. But maybe this one, um, because it's bipartisan, I think it can rise to the top. And our firefighters are suffering and they need our support. And when we rang for them, they showed up and now they're ringing for us and I'd like to show up for them. Senator Switzinski, thank you so much. Thank you, Shannon, for having, having me. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.